It's yet another Friday, and that means yet another edition of the Zogby Report, real and unscripted, t- entitled The United State of Democracy. You know the drill. I'm John. I'm here with my son and partner, Jeremy, and we go over some of the hottest issues of the week, hottest issues of the day. Anyway, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. And we are, as we continue to remind people, real and unscripted. You don't have any idea what I'm thinking. And frankly, I may have an idea what I'm thinking, but I don't know what I'm thinking. Yeah. So we, we just kind of lead ourselves through this open-ended conversation. All right, I have three things on my mind, okay? Maybe two things. We're going to move from the broader kind of stuff down to the more specific, meaning what happened this past Tuesday. Mm. What does it mean for the uh, for Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina, for the Democrats, and for the Republicans as we look ahead? And then um, uh, move on to... Uh, uh, you know what what is likely to happen from here on in uh, as we see it of course we have Georgia next week uh, not only a battleground state but a highly disputed mm. state but let's start with the broad if if we could you know you know because you've lived with them I've written a number of books and I've always portrayed myself and critics have portrayed me as the optimist in the room to the point where some of the critical uh, critics you know, have a tendency to refer to me as Pollyannish, mm. that I see blue skies ahead. And so briefly, you know, the first book, The Way Will Be, I did. I painted a fairly blue sky optimistic approach uh, coining the phrase the first globals for the millennial generation i think giving me a lot of hope that the things will uh, will get better the second book was entitled first globals went into even more detail and even more of the research done about why i'm high on the fact that young people just are not steeped in the crap of my age cohort that uh, you know, there it's it's not quite a fully com, uh, clean slate, but a much cleaner slate to kick off and look to the future. And then the third was about America's tribes, the neo tribes. Spent a total of a decade working on that. And the important thing, I think, the unique piece of that book was that while we found these tribes based on cognitive identity. Um, I'm a member of a tribe because of how I define myself, as opposed to what anthropologists or or other social scientists self-identification. Basically. Self-identification. The fact is, I think the the discovery working together that we found was that even the most distinctive and mutually exclusive tribes still have crossover, still have what we call um, uh, tribal border crossings where they can we can find common denominators and they don't have to be either enemies or for that matter uh, opponents Mm -hmm. so i am optimistic an optimistic person in the room yeah but here's the question should i be or have things turned a corner and as we watch the news unfold and a myriad of issues and and events and folks who were heroes yesterday now with feet of clay today do 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 i have any reason to be hopeful what Hmm. do you what do you think that's a that's a deep question (laughs) so does that mean we're over with this uh, no 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 um so Yes and no, okay. um, but ultimately it's up to us. Mm-hmm. And there are forces that collide. There, there are there are national forces, and there are local forces. There's top down forces, and there's bottom up forces. When you talk about tribes and crossover, that gives me hope. That gives me reason to think that there's optimism because that's very true. Because when the people are left to define themselves, um, yes, 
they do uh, find themselves into their own unique tribes that are based on aspirations and values. That shouldn't be any surprise. That's humanity, mm -hmm. right? We've always had that tribal aspect of it, which doesn't have to be necessarily a negative thing. It can be mm -hmm. a negative thing, but but that breakout of of distinct tribes is the innate diversity within humanity. And I think that's a good thing. I think we should celebrate that. The problem is, is that there are forces that hate that. There are forces that don't like that. There are forces that want to make oneness or want to divide these, these tribes against each other. And unfortunately, when we succumb to that, which a lot of it comes from the major outlets of information, because when is the last time any news had said, hey, folks, today's top story is we're united. Well, we see nothing of that. But I have a sense that if we were left unto ourselves, no, I don't think it would be, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it would be all peace in the streets. But I think people would be forced to realize more and more, hey, we, we do have, there are some shared uh, commonalities. There are some shared values. And guess what? We need each other. And so from that perspective of the breakout of tribes, mm -hmm. there's diversity and there's crossover and people, you know, when, I don't know if I want to say when, when left unto themselves, but maybe something like that would probably, there would, there would, there would be a spontaneous order. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that there are so many publications and there are so many media outlets that don't want that narrative. And so what do they do? They, they say, no, it's either left or right. And one pu publication and one media channels is entirely left. And the others are entirely right. And what do they talk about? The left, the left, the right, the right. And then we fall into that. And we, we are pitted against each other and we, 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 we fall for it. And this, is, this has been throughout history. I'm just going to say one other thing. Um, that, well, go ahead, because I've, I've said a lot. Well, we can continue this conversation. So I, I, I wonder, a lot of that focus on the media. Yeah, understandably. I mean, this is how we communicate with each other. You might, uh, if you're an optimist, say, well, you know what? We don't have to be reliant on a few cable channels and the, the dominant major networks of the New York Times and the Washington Post. We now have a multiplicity of sources and if, uh, the good side of people is if they pick and choose their sources, pick and choose them wisely, perhaps the majority will not opt for those narrow, isolated ones that are filled with hate and filled with conspiracy theories and filled with diversions uh, that bring out the worst devils of our nature. But maybe um, if left to our own, folks could kind of steer their way towards, you know, commonalities, uh, positive issues, mm -hmm. solutions. Unfortunately, I think what I just said is so nice, but uh, and I'm still the optimist in the room over the long haul. Believe me, but I just don't know that average folks, and I'm not saying that in, in any way as a criticism or as a sense of arrogance, but you know, people who have to focus on putting food on the table, people who have to focus on getting the kids to school on time, filling up a lunch pail and getting to work on time, uh, social activities and so on, have the time to sift through sources of information. Yeah. And so it's the noise yeah. that, uh, that, that wins, perhaps always wins. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I think you were, were saying this, and you said that they were, all these outlets are filled with hate and conspiracy theories. I think we can recognize that that's really on, on both. Mm. It's, it's, it's totally, oh, because yeah. unfortunately... On the left, there's this notion that only people on the right are, are conspiracy theorists. Well, that's not true. We saw what happened in 2000, uh, 2016. That was a giant conspiracy theory with, with really no solid evidence, as we 
find out more and more, but, the, but that's not the point. The point is, in building on this conversation, is that we become so national in our outlook. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a problem. More of us are focused more and more on what Biden said mm-hmm. and what Trump said and the who's who of the Washingtonian DC class. And yet most of us, and we're all guilty of this, probably don't even know who's running for school board, probably can't even name all the people on the, the, the city council, mm-hmm. uh, don't even really know, you know who's heading uh, this municipality and, and how that really affects our, our life. And so that's a dangerous trend. And I think that the way to flip this and the way to go forward is part of me wants to say, turn off the goddamn television, mm-hmm. but I don't know that that's realistic, but a local action, and, and that is happening. You know, the, 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 just go to a farmer's market, for example. Um, there are people who are awakening to the fact that I need to get to those school board meetings, but more of this needs to happen because that's how you celebrate diversity. Because the only diversity we know about is what comes through on these these channels, but the real diversity is in your backyard. It's in your community. That's where you build relationships. That's where you build neighborhoods and communities, and that's where we become rooted. And if you uproot that, we're just swimming in the unknown, and I think that that's dangerous. Does what happened in Buffalo last week Does that speak to millions of Americans? Is this young man, is there a base, a large following here that that we need to be worried about? Um, Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, yes, we, we, if if you're asking, do we need to know about that? Of course we need to know about that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that everything is so politicized. Even now, death and murder are politicized because in that same weekend, how many people know that a Chinese man walked into a Taiwanese church and unloaded on Taiwanese people? How many people know that in Chicago, 33 African-Americans were shot, uh, probably 20 of which died because of, of gunshots? And that, by the way, that's a typical weekend in Chicago. And so the problem is, is that now even death and shootings and mass deaths become politicized and it becomes right versus left. It, you know, the, the way I understand it is killers are mentally deranged mm-hmm. and mentally deranged people have obsessions. Just do a brief history of violence. The son of Sam, what was he obsessed with? He was obsessed with men who got women and had girlfriends and so he would shoot them. You know, the Unabomber was obsessed with the environment. And so he indiscriminately killed people because he wanted to make the point industrialized society is bad. Of course, Jeffrey Dahmer was obsessed with gay men and young boys. And Ted Bundy was obsessed with women and killed women. And this kid uh, was obsessed with race. Mm -hmm. And so they say he had a manifesto, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't a manifesto. It was the ramblings of a mentally deranged person, kind of like what the Unabomber had. And so I'm really troubled when, when our governor jumps on that. And if, instead of, of finding a moment of healing and unity, she looks to collectivize and seg- send signals that this is what you get with Trumpism. And I just don't think that that's really the way to go about it. So this boy, 18, uh, living in Conklin, New York, uh, outside of the southern tier, outside of Binghamton and all, uh, uh, literally has two feet in New York State, where we, I haven't done a study, but let's say we have the m- most severe, among the most severe gun control legislation of, of any other state, but is able to, I would say, literally take two steps into Pennsylvania and buy everything that he needs. Mm -hmm. This is with a history of instability, Mm. a history of being interviewed by the police, Mm. a history of school officials demanding that he be investigated. There is a mental health history that is not simply a question of mental health, but 
unstable and racist history. Should he be, I know we're getting into a hot one here. Mm -hmm. Should he have been allowed to just go into Pennsylvania where, where he was able to get all the tools that he needed legally Mm -hmm. uh, without a background check, without a waiting period, a cooling off period, what, uh, what, without markings, uh, the sorts of things that you, you are required to get, um, in, in New York. Yeah. Uh, is that not part of this tragedy, a big part of it? Well, I think I think you answered your own question. Uh, I mean, I think most states have laws where if, if there is, you know, s- series of, of mental um, cases or, or issues or, or suicidal thoughts or, or even being institutionalized, then, and you've proven that you can be a danger to others and to yourself, then, I mean, I... I I think that that we should applaud that, and and I don't think that somebody with uh, that kind of history uh, should. I mean, the, the kid threatened months ago that he was going to shoot up his school. Yeah, and I don't think his 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 school was in the inner city. I mean, he wanted to kill people, right? Um, and so, but the fact is, is that like you said, they slept on that. They yeah. he was brought in for evaluation. He was held for one day. And then they released them. And, and I'm left a- asking this question. You mean to tell me the feds weren't aware of this? I mean, the system that we have, I mean, when you go to buy a gun, that automatically automatically goes to the FBI. If you if you want to buy a firearm, it has to go to the- I have a question about that, but finish your sentence. Yeah, finish it has yourself. to go, this, this is my understanding. It has to go through mm-hmm. a database, through the FBI, and usually purchasing- a weapon takes about 20 to 30 to 40 minutes. And so there are flaggings. There are flaggings on social media. We live in a surveillance state. Um, it is no secret because of what Snowden leaked that intelligence agencies, including the FBI, are getting this data loaded. Even local police have flagging systems. They have tools that can, that can gather but you this see, data. I think we're talking loopholes here, and, and I'm not 100% sure, but... Just as you can walk into a farmer's market and buy organic vegetables and not have your vegetables uh, uh, tested, are they really organic or just marked organic? Uh, in Very similar to farmer's markets, there are off-the-books gun shows, informal gun shows, tables at... Uh, county fairs where I can go in and buy weaponry that is um, uh, that has no serial number um, has no tracking system uh, is has no history Mm -hmm. and I can buy that and while yes I put my name down uh, and an address down. I'm not entirely sure that that information is a legally required to be submitted to alcohol, tobacco, firearms, or or FBI. Or secondly, if it is required, I'm not so sure that the folks who run these informal uh, gun shows and and uh, uh, tables register anyway. I think it's just a cash, in many instances, a cash transaction. And if that's the case, should we not be cracking down? Yeah, I, I don't, ha- I, you know, I don't have intimate knowledge of of those those how those things work. Um, all I can say is that my main question that I was building up to is why does the we we asked the question why do these shootings keep happening? And, and that we should be asking that. But I think the question sh- should be followed up is, why do they keep happening when law enforcement are aware of these, mm-hmm. these, these criminals months and weeks in advance? And we have to say, are they not tipping off the, the, the FBI? Of course they're tipping off the FBI. That's the first thing you do when you know about somebody who, who gives 
uh, some kind of major threat continuously. But that, so, rev- that but, involves... But, but I'm still finish. talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what I'm getting at is how, 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 how can they not be preventing this stuff, okay? And here's the other thing. There's the phenomenon of the black market. Mm-hmm. And so even if you... And, and let's say you're right, because I don't know. But let, let's say even if you banned those, those gun shows, do you really think that they're still not going to be happening? Do you really think that drug cartels still aren't flooding the, through the border mm-hmm. with, with weapons and drugs? They still are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so <laughs> what I'm getting at ultimately is... Is it the knee-jerk reaction that we should be focusing on as, you know, that, that's that's tantamount to make it difficult, more difficult or impossible to get get guns? Or is it more holistic and, and you know, more of a, a, a pro, an approach that focuses on mental illness and what should communities do when, when there's somebody who's clearly disaffected? I hear more about politicizing the issue and focusing on, on the tools and, and, and not necessarily the root of the problem. And my final statement is, if we follow what you're suggesting, then that means that a kid like this who has been interviewed, um, has been deemed unstable, has been deemed a white supremacist, um, then... Th- uh, that should trigger surveillance. Uh, that he should be tracked, followed, h- however it's done electronically or, or personally. And then that raises the issue that's the essence of what this country is about. You know, what, what are individual rights and at what point do you give up the right, uh, you know, to to live your life privately. Uh, I think I know the answer, but um, I don't think that my answer is an answer that's necessarily going to fit uh, what uh, individual rights advocates uh, feel. Well, if I wasn't clear what I was trying to say in really just summing it up as, as simply and briefly as I can is that are, we're not focusing on, on the real root of the issue. We're bringing up race, and yet just weeks ago, we had the opposite happen, where an African-American shot up a bunch of white people in a subway and basically believed that white people should die. And that was covered for about 24 hours. I don't think race is really the way we want to cover this. When shootings happen, we should focus that human beings are, are being lost, are, are dying. And that's not what's happening in the media. We're, we're profiling the, the deaths and we're choosing which deaths we want to focus on. And my point about the surveillance state is we have one of the biggest surveillance states yeah. in the world, probably top three, China, and probably a tie between the UK and the United States. And this stuff is still happening. Why are the feds sleeping on it? That's my question. I think that needs to be investigated into. Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, I don't believe that the subway shooter got short shrift um, as, you know, um, as an uh, angry uh, black man, um, which is a whole issue that that needs to be discussed just as much as this young man in Buffalo didn't get short shrift as a, a white supremacist de- bound and defined by his hate and to the degree that his ramblings could even be called a manifesto. A manifesto is where you state what you're going to do and he clearly stated what he was going to do and in fact if he wasn't caught and I don't see how he's not caught. But if he wasn't caught, he would. He was prepared to move elsewhere. Can we switch to politics? You want a final word? In the- I was just going to say that. I mean, he called himself an eco-fascist. He he said that Fox News had a global was part of a global conspiracy mm-hmm. to uh, to oust him. It wasn't a manifesto. It was it was it was deranged rambling. Mm-hmm. But let's let's move on. Okay. Um, 
All right, so we had the selection Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and frankly, we had Oregon and, and Idaho. Uh, so let's start with the obvious question. Did, did Donald Trump have a good week? I don't, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, what do you think? Um, I think he had a mixed yeah. week. Okay. Uh, I, I think that his endorsement matters. You know, he clearly uh, enabled some people who were down in the pack to emerge higher in the pack or to actually win. But if you're actually keeping a tally, a, a scoreboard, no, it wasn't a, a great week. Pennsylvania is complicated. We still don't know the winner. And that really can go either way. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Roz's lead, which I'm putting in question mark, okay? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a, a, thousand? a thousand votes out of uh, one and a half million cast that's pretty good one not quite one tenth of one percent we're not over it's only 99 percent of the vote but i know is each new percent is tallied oz's margin is declining so now it is about a thousand and eighty seven on election night it was almost two thousand nineteen hundred or so i don't know where that's going to go what i do know is that um Donald Trump gets his candidate. I mean, in no way was David McCormick, or for that matter, the number three finisher who did very well, Mm -hmm. Kathy Barnett. There was no way that uh, they were not going to embrace and be embraced uh, uh, by him. Now, his chosen candidate in uh, North Carolina, uh, Ted Budd, won hugely. On the other hand, he went after the sitting governor, of Idaho uh, and uh, backed the lieutenant governor who is self-identified magna, stolen election in 2020. You know, all of the pieces of that, let's call it manifesto, that's the word of the of the day. But she got trounced. Mm-hmm. She got trounced. I mean, so that's one piece of it. Now we're going into Georgia mm. on Tuesday. And he backed... Uh, David Perdue, who retired from the U.S. Senate, by all accounts, didn't really want to run. And for that Mm -hmm. matter, it doesn't look like he really is running. He's not out there appearing at zillions of rallies. Trump and his supporters are kind of very disappointed at, at Perdue. Nonetheless, Brian Kemp, who allowed for, allowed for the, um, the two Democratic Senate victories and the, vic- the narrow margin right, of Joe Biden, uh, the Republican governor is ahead by 32 points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> that that kind of looks like uh, that's yeah. going to be problematic. Alabama looks like it might be problematic, too, next week. When yeah. that, uh, uh, so something's, something's percolating in the Republican Party, and you're starting to hear, I'm going to call them brave souls, only because whether I agree or disagree is immaterial. Uh, But these are people that are now challenging uh, Donald Trump. Um, Yeah. Is there really that something going on there? Could this be, while Trump controls the Republican Party, and there are many who fear him. You're going to continue to see that and want him then to be the, the nominee in 2024. Does Trump have reason to be worried? Well, yeah, but this is natural when, when you're in the primary season, because if we go all the way back to the lead up to the Democratic primary in 2020, I mean, there, it was just a mud flinging, slinging mm. show. I mean, you had the the progressives uh, within the wing within the Democratic Party who were all about Bernie, who were talking about how Joe Biden is a racist. And, and look at what Jesse Helm, Jesse Helm used to, uh, which is actually true, used to say that Biden is the is now a part of the enlightened ranking of, of the, the Senate because of certain uh, segregation bills that Biden supported. Um, 
And so they were eating each other alive until it was clear that Bernie was out, Buttigieg had no chance, Kamala had no chance, and all the others. And then they all flocked to, to Biden and, and said, um, Biden's our guy. And they forgot about all that those insults. The same thing is going on in the Republican Party. Yeah, we're tired of Trump. We've had enough of him. But whoever <coughs> emerges the victor, um, they're gonna they're gonna go behind that person, and so I, I I think that's what we're seeing. I know we're not there yet in 2024, but I think that that analogy of 2020 kind of fits into place. That you can expect um, the the infighting within within the party, but when the moment you know calls for unity. They're, they're all going to go behind whoever is the uh, the chosen person. I wonder. I mean, Kathy Barnett in Pennsylvania has clearly indicated that she would not support the winner of, uh, of, of the Republican primary for Senate. Now, was she leveraging? Was she looking for a, a better job or... Uh, looking for a position on Fox News as a as an actual paid commentator, I don't know. But you know, what you said about Joe Biden is really fascinating. Uh, coming from Delaware and entering the the U.S. Senate in the 1970s, the the number one issue um, at that moment in time regarding race and integration and so on was busing. And uh, uh, Biden was an opponent of busing. Fast forward two decades later, he's the principal sponsor of the anti-crime legislation, um, a good bit of which you know dealt with mandatory minimum sentencing for violent crimes, uh, uh, for for drug possession, was clearly discriminatory against blacks. A whole lot more. For the larger percentage of blacks found themselves uh, behind bars. Um, all right. So with that said, let's quickly talk about the Dems. Okay. Um, so are, are we in a situation where the Republicans are going to march forward with, and I'm only using these terms because they're out there, MAGA candidates mm-hmm. for the Senate and the House and Bernie candidates, uh, uh, especially in the House of Representatives on the left. What happens to what the the um, great um, U.S. historian James McGregor Burns once referred to as the vital center in this country? We're going to have left versus right going into 2022 and then possibly 2024. You know, it would be nice to see the, the middle come back, but I, I just don't see that with the extremity of the issues. With the extremity of the issues comes the extremity of the candidates, and then they feed each other. So, I, I, I you know, if you can show me within the Republicans a viable uh, candidate uh, who who's middle of the road or, or who's moderate, who can, you know, really charge them up, I'm willing to listen. Mm-hmm. And my final point is um, our hypocrite of the week. Okay, I, th- and this is partisan. I know uh, Ron DeSantis uh-huh. taking credit for new and heavy spending service programs <laughs> in Florida, all based on what's the source of that money? Federal stimulus money. That's hypocritical. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's why politicians don't come from Plato's Academy. They come from the school of sophistry. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say one other thing. You know, the United State of, of democracy, uh, and that, that's a question mark there. Mm. That's not a statement. We're, we're asking that. And everything we've talked about with the elections just reminds me of how the, the mistrust and the distrust is so heavy on both sides, but yet... There's still this tendency to blame the other. Mm. And I, I know I've said this over and over, but I just want to remind our listeners that, first of all, we have a whole history of election denialism mm-hmm. in, in this country, going back to, you know, all the way to, to, the, to the beginning of the 19th century. Um, 
But 2016 was really bad. Um, 2018 continued with, with Stacey Abrams. And then, of course, 2020 went to the next level uh, with, with uh, the Republicans. The point is this. We can't blame either party. They're both doing it. And here's the problem. It's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. That issue in Georgia is going to come back um, come, come November. Um, that's not going to go away. We're going to see this in a lot of battleground states. Ultimately, we'll probably see it in 2024. Sadly, I think you're right. Um, but where the hope to, to come full circle is, if we're, we have our eyes to the ground on what happens locally, it becomes much more difficult to pull that off in local elections. If you focus all your attention on the local elections, it's much harder to, to do that at the state and the federal level. But I think it's much easier to be able to regulate and make sure that there are authentic and an integral or, or elections with integrity at the local level. So, last word. Have a good week, everybody. We'll see you next week, uh, opening up what we hope to be a happier Memorial Day weekend. Still an optimist, I'm John. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.